Hi, I'm Sunit Mittal for Heart Rhythm TV, uh, and welcome to this session uh, that's coming uh, from the European Heart Rhythm Society meetings. And I'm joined here today by Henry Wong from Chicago, and uh, really delighted uh, that you could join us today. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. Yeah. So Henry, yesterday you presented a late-breaking clinical trial on cardioneural ablation. I thought that our members would be very interested uh, in the finding. And so maybe I could just ask you to talk a little bit about what is cardioneural ablation. Sure, definitely. So the cardiac uh, autonomic nervous system has intrinsic and extrinsic components. And it, it's been observed that during ablation for pulmonary vein isolation for AFib, that sometimes the heart rate would change. And this is because we are essentially modifying using thermal energy the, gangl the ganglionated plexi. And about 10 years ago, Dr. Pachon uh, began to use uh, ablation of ganglionated plexi to treat people with vasovagal syncope and sinusoidal dysfunction. Um, this has become an emerging treatment, and cardioneuroablation is becoming performed more often. Now, it's less well studied how well it works uh, for patients with vagal mated AV block. And so that was the impetus of this registry. Great. So tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the patient population and, you know, what were the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Sure, for, for sure. And that's the important part for this procedure to be successful. Again, this needs to be vaguely mediated or functional AV block. So ideally, these are patients with less comorbidities, less likely to have infranodal levels of block, and those patients were excluded. Uh, we also excluded patients with, only with nocturnal AV block. And the interesting thing and good design of the study is they were sort of triple checked. You know, we looked for this based off clinical information. Uh, patients also could undergo atropine testing or third, actually, conduction study at the time of their cardioneuroablation. So again, very important that you select the right of patients for this to be successful. And tell me a little bit about the actual procedure. Was that standardized? Did you have a predefined protocol for what was acceptable during the procedure? Uh, to some extent, you know, all, all groups, all operators use 3D anatomic mapping. And generally, we know where ganglionated plexa are. Now, the tricky part is, you know, what sort of mix uh, is parasympathetic versus sympathetic innervation, as Dr. Valdebrano brought up in the commentary. Um, fractionation uh, of electrograms can occur uh, due to anisotropy at those sites. Um, you know, some centers may have used CT to look at. And some, about half of the centers use extracardiac vagal stimulation as an endpoint for ablation. Great. And can you summarize a little bit about your findings? How many people were enrolled and what happened to those patients in follow-up? Sure. Uh, we enrolled 130 patients and um, 126 cases were determined to be acutely successful. Five of the patients actually had progression and then two patients uh, did not have an improved in AV block but the others did meet sort of our acute procedural endpoints. In terms of our primary outcome, which was recurrence of syncope or symptomatic high-grade AV block, uh, this occurred uh, for 14 patients. Of the patients with follow-up up to one year, 78% um, 78 of the patients had success. So showing it's probably feasible, you know, probably safe. Um, we did some sub-analyses to look at how outcomes were with experienced, meaning operators with more than 50 cases and less. Uh, there's a trend toward better outcomes, but again, this is an emerging treatment. And in these patients you chose, they, the only procedure that they were having done was this uh, uh, procedure, right? They weren't having concomitant AF ablation or SVT ablation? That's exactly right. Yeah, just uh, ablation for cardioneuroablation only. Great. And where do you think the next steps in this process are going to be? What more, uh, you know, do we need to do to advance the science further? Yeah, it's, you know, again, um, like with many emerging fields, there are experienced centers that have a lot of knowledge. You know, we need to learn more about the mechanisms and pathophysiology and selecting, you know, the right patients. Um, and so, you know, as this spreads, um, you know, I think it's important that we communicate, we learn, uh, we share data. There is a prospective um, registry that we're doing. It's a crossover design uh, where the patients are their own control. They have the ablation and then outcomes fall in the other arm. This is the CNA Ford registry, uh, which is international as well. Uh, and, you know, really, we also probably need a sham control study. Yeah. Compare this, so. yeah. And lastly, I guess I'd love for you to comment on you know, how long did these procedures take and were there any acute or near-term complications observed? 
Right. So the procedures were about 100 minutes. Uh, we did not collect uh, fluoroscopy data. Uh, so they weren't too long. About 90% were biatrial. So this includes transeptal for most of them. Uh, 7% were right atrial only, and the rest were left atrial only. Um, outcomes are probably about 10% better, uh, you know, at least for cardioneuroblation for other indications with biatrial ablation versus right atrial only. Now, uh, anticoagulation, you know, uh, is still a question. How long do we anticoagulate afterward in these patients? Um, but, you know, we're hoping to learn more as we get more data. Perfect. Well, Henry, thanks very much. Congratulations to you and your co-investigators for the prior CNA study. Uh, congratulations on presenting it as a late-breaking clinical trial at these European Heart Rhythm Association meetings. And we look forward to continued advancement in this field. Thanks so much.